Oh, and she said, I just got carried away and I felt like the cackling hags were ganging up on me. Cackling hags? Welcome back to Bravo Breaking News. So this week on New York, the ladies went from Shakshuka in Sag Harbor to Brinsgiving in Brooklyn. And of course, wherever they go, the drama follows. We're going to give all our thoughts on the cackling hags, Brin's troubled past, and more. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any Bravo Breaking News. But before we dive into the Roni episode this week, I did want to share that I got to meet Queen Ariana Maddox yesterday. She did an event in LA in Century City. She's just launched a new lipstick collection with Lip Lab. Um, there are four shades that she has designed. One of them is My Ride or Die. There's one called Something About Her. Super cute. Um, I, I love the collection and I loved meeting her. So I just wanted to give a little shout out um, about her and the new collection so you guys can go to Lip Lab and check it out. Yeah, and make sure you go to Bravo Breaking News on Instagram to see Kim's interview with Ariana. You guys looked so cute. Um, how's the product? It's great. Um, you know, I'm not personally like a lipstick person, but, you know, the fact that Ariana designed this herself, it's really cool because like you go there and you create a shade out of like every pigment they have imaginable. So mm. she created these from the ground up. Um, and she's very passionate about it, really excited about it. Um, she was such a sweetheart. I did not get any Vanderpump Rules tea because, you know, she's like under contract. Um, but she did share that something about her is moving right along. They're, you know, dealing with the permit issues and they will be open soon. So I'm excited to see that, you know, come to life. Oh, my God. I cannot wait to go get a sandwich there. I am so happy for them. So amazing news that you got to meet the queen herself. Should we get into the episode? Yes. Okay. So can I just say one thing that I've noticed with this reboot of Roni is I love this opening. I feel like it's the first, and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like it's the first time that we're seeing just the women themselves without the families in the background. You know how usually they have like the husband, the kid, and the dog like way in the background and the woman's up front like doing a little pose. And this time it's just the women. It's like black with gold. I just think it looks very chic. And so I'm into it. But OK, so we're waking up in the Hamptons. It's their their last day there um, or they're departing. And we finally get our Shakshuka Kim. So excited. Sai Shakshuka excited. Seriously, Sai was ready to eat as soon as she woke up. And I completely relate to that. I've trained myself to just need breakfast right away. Jenna comes out in, you know, very casual clothes, but then she's like dripping in diamonds. She's having this like breakfast at Tiffany's moment she references. So she's cutting tomatoes in like a million dollars worth of diamonds. And I thought it was a very interesting choice that she like brought those on the trip with her. Doesn't that really seem like Jenna's style, but hey. I was I was into it. Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, she was like totally breakfast at Tiffany's vibe and I was here for it. OK, so then we get to taste the shakshuka, but we also get some of Uba's hot sauce. Uba, Uba hot. Yes. And, you know, I really am impressed with all these ladies because it seems like they're all true business women. You know, Sai's got her thing going on. Uba has her hot sauce brand on top of modeling we find out Erin is in real estate, but she also has her design company on the side. Jenna is obviously an icon. And then Bryn, I think they said does like PR or marketing. We haven't quite figured that part out yet. And then Jessel, we know, is is in fashion PR. So I really like that they're all like these strong business women and, you know, they have something going for themselves. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, we didn't get a lot about Bryn's professional life this episode like everybody else, but we learned a lot about her personal life. And the first of which was at that breakfast table. You know, she opens up, everybody's talking about what they're going to do for Thanksgiving. And unfortunately, Thanksgiving is a really rough time for her because she doesn't really have any family. We learned that she was raised by her grandmother because her mom was a young mom, or I think her mom was young. Her dad, you know, kind of did some bad things and neither one of them was really in the picture to raise her. And she just really doesn't have anybody to spend the holidays with. So it's a tough time for her. But we do learn that she is going to be spending this year with her third ex-fiance, Gideon. 
And, you know, she kind of says, you know, I've had three fiancés, but I'm basically setting myself self up for success because I would have had three divorces at this point if I had gotten married and I do not want to get divorced. And honestly, I kind of loved that, you know, like, why not test it out and see how it goes and, you know, not move forward with the marriage if you're not, you know, 100 percent committed. So I think she has a point. Yeah, absolutely. I think she's super smart. I think a lot of women, you know, kind of get married just to get married when it's not exactly right. So she's like, you know, open to taking it as far as it can go. But then she's not going to take that final step. And I think she's smart if she's not sure about it. But her fiance did look very cute, her ex fiance. And even Aaron was like, I wish she would get back together with him. He's very cute. Yeah, I know. Didn't she say there was still like a a 20% chance they would get married or something like that? Like, I don't know. They are like conscious. Yeah. And coupled. his odds are increasing as, as time goes on. Yeah, exactly. So who knows what's going to happen? But it was kind of nice to get a little insights to Bran. You know, it's kind of been very surface level with her until this episode. And we got to know a lot about her. Yeah. And I was also very shocked that Jessel actually complimented Aaron's shakshuka. Jessel, who has complained nonstop from the beginning to end of this trip, said that that shakshuka was in the top three of shakshukas that she's had. And, you know, I was like, Aaron, you take that win and you store it and put it on your shelf because it doesn't seem like Jessel doles out those compliments very often. Yeah. Meanwhile, Sai was still complaining about the food. She, these women are very hard to please. I mean, you have Jenna Lyons, probably the most successful and rich of the group, being the most easygoing and carefree and, you know, Yes, she did leave and sleep at her own house. Um, but I don't know. It's just like these women like have really high standards for really no reason at all. So I think they need to chill out a little bit. Yeah, for sure. OK, so then we're back in the city. We see Aaron, you know, doing some maybe staging or maybe she's decorating for a property that she has. We find out that she works for Douglas Elliman and she is on Frederick Eklund's team. And I was like, Okay, I love a crossover. Like I hope we get to I hope we get a Frederick cameo at some point. I'm unclear on if Erin is actually still selling real estate or if she's sort of all in on her homegirl business. Such a cute name, by the way. But I do really hope we get a cameo from Frederick. She obviously grew up rich. Her parents are extremely successful real estate developers, and she's taken it upon herself to make a career of her own. You know, she's not just like you know, counting on mommy and daddy's trust fund money or whatever. She has made a whole business of her own. And that's respectful. I I like doing that because not everybody in her position would go and do something like that. Totally. She said she got her real estate license when she was like 19. I'm like, God, when I think about what I was doing at 19, I had zero responsibilities except to go to class and like get good grades. Yeah, so I, I'm warming up to Erin more and more each episode, honestly. She's just like very down to earth and I find her relatable and kind of like refreshing. I think she's like very authentic and just like, I don't know, no bullshit. And that's kind of what I like about her. But we did get more insights into Bryn as well back in the city. So she's going to this hair salon and they wet her hair and it totally like frizzes up. It's like the biggest hair you'll ever see. We usually see it when it's been relaxed or straightened. And she is actually biracial. Her mom is white. Her dad is black. She struggled kind of with her hair her entire life because she has that, you know, texture that's hard to keep up with. But she was raised by her white grandmother who really didn't know how to kind of deal with it or style it. So she kind of learned all of this from like this black salon that she used to go to. And it was just such like an eye-opening, empowering story to come from Bryn. Because like I said, I mean, we we didn't really know her at all until this episode. And she is really opening up and sharing her, you know, her struggles and stories. Yeah. I mean, I did not realize that she was biracial. And I really appreciated this scene so much. She said that it takes three to six hours a week for her to get her hair straightened. God, that is dedication. She has beautiful hair. And I think I saw someone in the comments, I can't remember if it was on our video or on Instagram somewhere, someone asking if Bryn was, you know, biracial or part black. And 
you know, someone said yes. And I was like, is that true? Like, I would have never thought. So just hearing her talk about this was really interesting. And and yeah, hearing about how she had like her only real exposure to black culture was in this hair salon. I thought that was really like special of her to share that. So then we go on to Uba, who is meeting with her business partner slash mentor. She, you know, wants to grow Uba Hot and she needs some investor money to do so, but she's nervous to take this investor money. She kind of shares that her mom was is really her inspiration. Her mom was the breadwinner. And, you know, she feels kind of like alone because she doesn't have her mom around, even though she has friends in, in New York. But you know, it's just, it's kind of sad. And I'm like, I'm really impressed with these women so far because it feels like in every episode, we are getting these real vulnerable moments that are giving us incredible insight into who they are as people. And I feel like normally on Housewives, you kind of maybe get that once per season, you know, with maybe one of the castmates will share something super intimate like that. And so far with Roni, we're getting this every episode and sometimes with multiple cast members. And it's really making me feel connected to them in a way that I think is different than, you know, just enjoying watching them on TV and and fight over, you know, food and sandwiches and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know. I just I was noticing that we're just getting all this vulnerability and I'm really into it. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, And we jump over to size. We finally get to meet Sai's husband, who, you know, is retired, doesn't work anymore, stays at home with the kids. And I I just got to say, like, my first impression, all I'm going to say is that he's not what I was expecting. But, you know, we learn that they have a very strong relationship. Um, So, you know, I'm happy for her. We get a little bit of insight into their home life, you know, and she basically says that she really relates to Bryn. So she wants to, you know, host a Bryn's giving in Bryn's honor. And his, her husband is totally fine with that. You know, they're cracking jokes. He seems very supportive. And he's also kind of reading her the riot act about leaving Jessel alone, which I found mm-hmm. interesting. You know, he's basically like, you know, Sai's the one that has really been like on Jessel. I think Sai and Aaron are the ones that are like, you need to have sex with your husband like immediately. Like, why aren't you? And he's like, look, you don't know what it's like to have two-year-old twins. Like, give them a break. Maybe take it easy on her. And, you know, maybe let's, you know, try to plan some sort of staycation so they can try to find that time to be together. Yes. I was so on Team David in this moment. I was like, thank you. Someone is, you know, saying what I was thinking. Like, have some empathy for this woman. You know, she's got She's got one-year-old babies. They're all over the place. And he was like, you don't know what her body went through to carry those twins. You don't know what the, the labor was like, the delivery. like." And it's like to have this coming from a man to someone who is also a mom, it was just, it just seemed backwards. But I was very appreciative that someone said it. And so they were kind of, you know, uh, Sai and Rin were also kind of like, okay, David, you're right. So I, I really enjoyed that. And yeah, made me, you know, That's the only glimpse we've, I think the second little glimpse we've gotten of David, but I'm on team David so far. So speaking of Jessel, we go over to Jessel and Pavit and, you know, she kind of gives us a glimpse into her day to day with the twins. You know, they're supposed to be starting school soon. She wants them to go to a Montessori school and Pavit's kind of like, I don't know if we need to like pay that much for them to go to preschool. And Jessel's response was so funny. She's like, but honey, like, I think it's the right network that we want. They had a charcuterie board and wine out at the open house. So you can kind of tell that her priorities might be a little different than her husband's. But they were also talking about like, well, Pavit wants them to go to public school. And it's like, well, public school doesn't start until kindergarten. I'm not sure if they realize this. But if you want the kids to go to any preschool, you're, you know, you have to pay. So what'd you take away from this conversation? I, you know, This scene in particular was one of the moments that I actually like related to Jessel because I feel like my husband and I would probably have a similar conversation. You know, I have I have high end taste that he not may not necessarily agree with all the time. So I really related to this. And especially when they started talking about her tendencies with her tone. (laughs) 
I mean, yeah, he was very he was choosing his words very carefully because she was basically saying, you know, the Hamptons were tough. She felt like a punching bag. And he was like, well, you know, kind of the way you say things sometimes can come out the wrong way and people might react to it. And she was like, so you're calling me a bitch. And he was like, I am not saying that. I am saying sometimes you have tendencies in your tone to say things the wrong way. So yes, he was calling her a bitch sometimes. But, uh, you know, what I did, I think he redeemed himself when she brought up like, you know, we were talking about our sex life and he did not seem phased by it at all. And he didn't seem concerned. He was like, look, this is what happens when you get married and have kids, especially twins. Like, it's going to, you know, we're just in a little bit of a dry spell and like, we'll get it back. So I think he redeems himself by that. And, you know, he does seem to be supportive of her. So we'll see how their little, you know, staycation pans out. Yeah. No, like I said, like I can relate. I'm in Aries. I can get a little hot headed sometimes and there can be tendencies in my tone, too. So somebody that can like kind of just talk to her directly, like have it and just, you know, tell it like it is and they can just get over it, I think is great. And he just seems so unfazed by the whole sex thing. You know, we've heard a lot online, you know, oh, Jessel's headed for divorce. Like Jessel and her husband, you know, have issues, da, 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 da. But like, I don't know. They kind of seem to be, while what it appears on the outside is not really what it seems like is going on inside their home. They seem to be, you know, other than the preschool, kind of on the same page and like, talk to each other about it. And I don't know, it doesn't really seem to be a major problem. It seems to be less of a problem between them and more of a problem between her and the ladies. A hundred percent. Yeah. So that's what I took away from that. I kind of warmed up to Jessel in this moment, but jury's still out on her because she does have a wrong way with words, which we (laughs) get more of at Bryn's Giving. So we make our way to Brooklyn Sai's hosting. Again, she makes a comment about the food like Sai. Just give it up. Erin gave you caviar. She gave you shashuka. She gave you a chef cooked dinner. Just let's let's move past this. So everybody arrives at Sai's house and it's a shoes off policy. And I don't know about you, but my mind immediately went to the Sex and the City episode where Carrie arrives at a party and she has to take her shoes off. And it's like the biggest deal And then at the end of the night, somebody leaves with her shoes. They steal her, I think they're Manolo Blahnik shoes. So I don't know. It was just giving Sex in the City vibes. You know, Aaron, what is your... But what's your policy on shoes in the house? I personally don't have a policy for shoes in my house. But even if I did, I would not make my guests take off their shoes at the front door for a party. Every time I've been somewhere to do that... It has felt so awkward and so weird. And it's like, I'm in like a guest's home, like barefoot. Is this really like, it just seems, it just doesn't seem right. What, how do you feel about it? Okay, so I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm an anti-shoes household, but I grew up in a shoes household. So it's been very hard to get, you know, my, my parents and my husband's parents to adapt to this. My dad acts it like it's the biggest you know, inconvenience in the world. It's so funny. But I will say if I'm having a party, I relax my rules a bit or if I'm having people over because the reality is like she's going to have a house cleaner there the next day and they're going to mop and it's going to be fine. So I'm with you. I think if it's, you know, if if I go to someone's house just casually to, you know, drop something off, I kind of naturally take my shoes off. But If I'm there for a party, I probably would expect to be able to keep them on. Yeah. And she did warn everybody in the text. You know, she said, I hope your shoes aren't part of your look because I'm going to make you take them off. And I guess Erin didn't quite read the text. She wasn't, you know, aware of this. But I don't know. I think Sai should have eased up a little bit. But then again, we don't live in New York City and that shit is dirty. So (laughs) I kind of get it. Okay, so Bryn is the first to arrive and she meets the the good looking chef, you know, and she oh, my God, her game face when it comes to flirting is just like she turns it on so quickly and you know sighs immediately like uh he's married and she's like oh okay then never mind and she keeps giving us this like these backwards hellos so anytime someone new comes in she wanted to show off the back of her dress and she's like 
hi, how are you? Hey, welcome to Thanksgiving. And it was just such a little like comedic, I don't know, welcome. Yeah, no, I, I loved that too. She is definitely like the comedic relief of the franchise, along with Uba, I think. Um, they both just bring a little bit of lightness. Yeah. So we find out that Erin was actually at her grandmother's memorial earlier and, you know, she's kind of telling Jessel about it. And again, we see Jessel just kind of doesn't always have the best way with words. And she's like, well, I hope it went well. And Erin's kind of like, yeah, it was fine. And then she walks away and Erin's like, what do I say to that? Like, yeah, it was a memorial. You know, it's it wasn't the time of my life. And she kind of references this missing, the missing chip that Jessel has. And I'm like, yes, that is it. She has this, just this tiny little piece missing that is like social norms. And it, she just can't quite get it right. Yeah, that was um, cringe to say the least. I mean, it's like she's, the conversation doesn't start off awkward. She's like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. And then she says, I hope it went well before she walks away. And I'm like, no, like you just ruined it. Like you were so close. You're on the right track. Yeah, so close. And then she just ruins it in an instant. Like, like quit while you're ahead. It's like Jenna said. It's like she's not thinking it through. It's almost like she's trying too hard. Like maybe just, you know, just just stop trying so hard. Just like be your authentic yeah. self. You don't need to like keep talking and keep the conversation going. Maybe just say what needs to be said and move on. Yeah, say less. But Jenna was actually coming to Jessel's defense here because she, well, earlier she had told Aaron that Jessel kind of referenced everyone else as the cackling hags. And then Aaron brings it up to people at, at Bryn's giving. And it seemed like the producer was kind of like, well, you know, did, were you stirring the pot? And Jenna's like, I promise you, I was not stirring the pot. And she's like, then why'd you say it? And she's like, I don't, I honestly do not know. So I, I don't know. But I think this is probably not going to be the last that we hear of the cackling hags comment. We see that scene where Jessel and Jenna like kind of make up. But I think Jenna is still holding like just a little bit of a grudge toward Jessel. So this is maybe... If she doesn't like, you know, not maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, like her way of maybe, you know, putting Je uh, putting Jessel back in mm. the hot seat a little bit with the other women because, you know, she rubbed Jenna the wrong way and this is what she gets. Yeah, maybe you're right. OK, so then we sit down for dinner. You know, Sai has this gorgeous tablescape with her. Did you notice her plates are Christian Dior? I did not, but I am very impressed. Oh, my God. And she's like, oh, I just threw it together. You know, I didn't have a runner. So I just grabbed branches. And of course, it's like perfectly, you know, green, perfectly symmetrical branches that she's placed beautifully on the table. And oh, I just threw it together. And I'm like, please stop. That would take me an hour to do, which it probably also took her. But anyway, it was pretty. You know, they start um, getting their food. And then, you know, we hear more from Bryn. Yeah, it's almost like it's like an instant reaction. Like she sits down, she's having fun, they're having cocktails. And then they sit down at the table and something triggers Bryn. You know, they're talking about the holiday again. And she just kind of breaks down. I mean, you know, she's, again, talking about what the holiday reminds her of. She shares that she like grew up in Section 8 housing, for the first six months of her life um, was the only time she was with her parents, you know, and basically like the two people that were supposed to love and support her couldn't and wouldn't. There was abuse. There was neglect. Like there was times where her diaper wasn't changed for like six days in a row or something mm. like that. And she just like this all comes flooding to her. And we also see in the confessional, you know, them try to ask her about this, too. And she just says, like, I, I can't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Like she can kind of talk about what happened, but she doesn't want to talk about really how it makes her feel. And my heart is just crushed hearing this. It is so sad to hear this from somebody who on the outside is such like a bubbly, like, you know, high energy, happy person to know what they're struggling with on the inside. It's like you never really know what anybody's going mm -hmm. through. And this is proof. That's exactly what I was thinking, too. Like, you truly never know the struggles that someone has has gone through and has overcome. Um, and it, 
the same. Like my heart was just breaking when she talked about how when she was a baby, you know, it sounded like something happened. Maybe her parents got taken away or uh, I don't know. But there was a point in time when like she was not being cared for for days on end. And that seems like that's when her grandmother probably took over. And it, it's just hard to imagine growing up that way. But then also like, you know, going into adulthood, like she must have deep seated trauma there. And it's just, it's heavy. It's heavy stuff. But I also think that like, I definitely applaud her for sharing this and for giving us that other side of her because I think it really opens our eyes. And it's empowering too, you know, like you go from, you know, being raised in a family like that um, in a very like difficult past to being a real housewife of New York, like dreams mm -hmm. do come true. I think it's empowering and I'm excited to kind of hear more about her journey and like kind of how she got to where she is today. So I'm sure we will get more and more of that every week. Um, thanks for tuning in for this week's recap. We will be back later this week to cover Orange County and next week for New York. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything. Bye, everyone.